We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. So thankful. Thankful for all that God has done, for the ways he's made. God bless you all as you take your seats. God bless you. I'm just so thankful that uh, we serve a good God. We serve a great God. The text says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And it's great to be in this place and be able to say that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a privilege, what an honor, what a blessing it is to be in the presence of the living God, to intentionally seek his face, to be given another day, to come into uh, his presence with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. It's such a wonderful thing to be resting in God and to be coming into the sanctuary and lifting our hands and praising him and hearing a word from the Lord. It's a wonderful thing. Amen. Amen. So today we'll be coming from the book of John chapter 14. John chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. John 14 verses 1 through 7. Uh, if you don't have Bibles, the ushers will be uh, handing out Bibles. Uh, if you just raise your hand, they can get one to you. Uh, if you have your Bible on your phone, that's perfectly fine too. Um, as uh, I was, as uh, my father, uh, Bishop Caesar, was speaking on uh, millennials, I was like, "Ouch! Like that? That stings! Like that's that's me! That's my people's what?" Uh, you know, I was thinking, I was like, man, I guess, you know, like the, the, the generation uh, before the, the, the baby boomers would probably say the same thing about or something similar in their context about you guys when you guys were coming up. Um, but it, it's an, it is an important thing to be giving and to be uh, seen giving to the things that you value. You give to what's important to you. Um, and I believe if the church is important to you, um, then you'll be in a, in a position to um, be a giver and, and to uh, help the ministry continue on and do what it is that God has called us to do as believers. Amen. 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 All right. So uh, John chapter 14, verse one through seven, and it reads, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The title of this message is Our God, the Waymaker. Our God, the Waymaker. Dear God, I just thank you so much. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for uh, who you've been to each, each person here. I thank you, Father, for this message. I pray that as I speak, you would be heard, you would be seen, you would be felt, and you would do what only you can do in the lives of your people. I pray that you would give a special touch to those that need a touch, God. I pray that you would bring uh, deliverance to those that need deliverance. I pray that the seed would fall on good soil, God, and that what you desire from this word would come to fruition as a result of the seed being scattered. Lord, I thank you and I praise you, Father, for each person. You know each challenge. You know each person's journey that brought them here to this seat at this hour, at this time. And I pray right now that you would be glorified. And we won't fail to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, for we ask you all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Many of us are uh, looking for changes in our lives. Uh, rapper Tupac Shakur wrote a song talking about, I, I still see, I see no changes. He wrote a song about changes. And he said he was frustrated because he looked at the climate and the culture of the world in time, at the time that he wrote the song and said there's no changes that he wants to see coming. He sees these changes, he, he knows the changes that he wants to see happen, but he was frustrated with the state of the culture and the state of society because he didn't see those changes coming to fruition and those changes happening. And we can feel the same in our lives. We can all want change and we can grow frustrated with the way our lives are because the change that we desire is not yet obtained. We all look for change sometimes in our situations, change in our hearts and change in our habits. 
And we sometimes don't see a way out, a way that things can be fixed, a way that things can change. But there was a time when a big, big, big disaster came across the earth and, and it came across the world and came across creation. And it seemed as though there was no way it would change. There was no way that there would be a way out. But we're going to take a look at that. But it leads me to my first point, which is this, to walk in God's way. There's a way that things should be, and that's God's way. And to walk in God's way, you must first leave your way behind. First point is this, to walk in God's way, you must first leave your way behind. And so in order to go down a route, if you're going down a, a GPS and you're, you're driving and the GPS says turn right, turn left, in order to make those turns and follow what the GPS is saying to do, you have to choose to go right or choose to go left. The GPS can say something. But you can say, oh, you know, I think I know a better route. I'm good. I'm going to take that route. And sometimes you do. And that route is the one that's backed up with traffic or, you know, whatever the situation or circumstance may be. But in various times, there's a certain way, a certain route that this particular system wants you to go. And so we see here in Scripture, in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, in Genesis, we see there was a certain way that God did things. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we see him putting everything together, speaking into nothing and creating everything that we know exists. Him saying, let there be and there was because he's God and he's a creator and he speaks and things come into being. And he has a certain structure, a certain order, a certain way that his creation is. And at the end of each day in creation, he says, this is good and this is good and this is good and this is good. And then he speaks and says, let us create man in our image, both male and female. He created them and he says, this is very good. And then we see that uh, the Lord takes man and puts man in the garden of Eden to keep the garden, to work the garden, and things are good there again. He has a plan, a system, a way things are, and that way is good. And in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, we see that he looks at man and says, it is not good that this man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And then the text says, the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. So we see here that God creates, he creates, he creates, and what he creates is good, and he sees man alone, and he says it's not good for this man to be alone. He uh, uh, causes the man to fall into a deep sleep, brings woman out of this man, and the two become one flesh, and the men, they are both naked and unashamed of their nakedness. But in all of this goodness, in order for love to be love, you have to choose to love. And God wants people that would choose to love him. Not just be mindless robots that, that uh, are dedicated for the sake of just dedication because we're wired that way. No, no, no. He presents another option. He gives another uh, 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 option in the garden. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, it says, The Lord God commanded them, saying, You, shall eat of, you can eat of any and every tree in the garden. But there's a specific tree, the knowledge of good and evil of that tree. You should not eat because the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And we see here that they had that option to choose God's way or to choose their way. In that moment, humanity was thrust into this situation. Uh, the decision was made to bite of this fruit of the tree that God said not to bite from. And since then, they wanted to become like God. Since then, we've been wanting to do it our way. Since then, we've wanted to reject God's way and do it our way. We've been fighting the true and living God for who has the final say, who is the final authority in the matters of our heart, in the matters of our desires, in the matters of our feelings, in the matters of our decisions, in the matters of our sexuality, our relationships, our finances, our livelihoods. We've been fighting with God over who is right and who is wrong because of this one decision. Let's take a look at how this decision came to be. Genesis chapter 3, it says this. Now, the serpent was more crafty, and he says to this woman, he says, did God actually say, this serpent speaks, the enemy speaks, he's crafty, and he says, did God say this? Did God actually say that you should not eat of any tree in the garden? 
The woman says to the serpent, yeah, we may eat of all the tree, the fruit, the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the true, the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, lest you shall surely die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not die. A direct contradiction to what the Lord had spoken. And she knew what the Lord had spoken. She said what he had spoken. But the enemy directly contradicted it and said, God is withholding something from you. God is lying to you. God is, he, he doesn't want the best for you. Because God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. You see, he was telling a half truth, but the lie that he left out would give them so much more pain, so much more heartache. He is the father of lies and he lies and it gets Eve's attention because in verse six of Genesis chapter three, it says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was the delight to the eyes and the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate and she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate and then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. God says, don't eat. The enemy is lying and he deceives Eve to, to believe that her way is right, to believe that she can be like God and she can make her own decision. And she grabs of this fruit. She bites of this fruit. And the text says she gave to her husband who was with her. Her husband who should have been the covering, her husband who should have been the protector, her husband who should have been the one that God said to work this field and, go, and, and guard this garden. But instead, he allows his wife to entertain a conversation that changes the whole trajectory of humanity. Adam is present, but he doesn't disagree. He joins right in and the chaos ensues. And that leads us to my second point, which is this. Our way does not end well. Our way does not end well. I'm going to say that again for those that think it does. Our way does not end well. The book of Proverbs chapter 16 verse 25 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end result is death. There's a way that seems okay, that seems all right, but the end result is death. And the death that takes place is not just a physical death, but a spiritual death. So when God says, do not bite of this fruit because lest you eat it, that day you eat it, you will surely die. We're reading this and we're thinking, oh, okay, we're going to die. Uh, we're reading this and we're thinking, okay, maybe Adam and Eve are going to die a physical death. So they bite it and they drop dead right then and there. No, no, no. God was not speaking of that death. The death that God was speaking about was eternal separation from the presence of the true and living God. Separation from God is death. The death, uh, because God is the source of your strength. God is the source of your life. And separation from him is death. So when they bite of this fruit, they lose their innocence. When they bite of this fruit, they lose their sense of wonder. They lose their sense of awe, their sense of thankfulness of what God has done in this garden and the majesty that he's given them and the authority that he's given them. They lose all of that when they bite of this fruit. They lose their fellowship with God, walking with God in the cool of the day in a perfect world. And, and they lose all of that, but they realize their nakedness. They realize their nakedness and in realizing their nakedness for the first time in their entire union, men and women look at each other's nakedness and become ashamed. Because the text clearly says that the two were naked and were unashamed. And here we see that they're naked and they decide to cover up their nakedness. Realizing their nakedness, they realize they lost their way. They realize that they lost their way and they try to their credit to maybe reverse the situation and make things right in their own way, in their own strength, in their own power. They try to make it right. You know you've done wrong when the decisions you make leave you exposed. You know you've done wrong when the end of your road leaves you ashamed and embarrassed. You know you've done wrong when the bitter taste of regret in your mouth and the, the bitter taste of shame in your heart is yours to keep after your decision. And that is where Adam and Eve found themselves, trying to right their wrongs their way, taking fig leaves and sewing them together to cover their nakedness. But fig leaves can only cover so much. Fig leaves can only cover so much. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, we see that the Lord God made for Adam and his wife 
garments of skins, garments of skins, and clothed them. Garments of skins and clothed them. You see, when Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves, they used fig leaves. But something had to die in order for God to cover them. Something had to die in order for God to cover them. It wasn't the full covering because that would come later. But God had to show them that something has to pay a price for you to be covered. So I'm going to cover you properly. I'm going to give you some animal skins that will cover you. And so he does that. And he, and, and he says, look, this is a, a temporary covering. But I have something long lasting. This is a temporary covering. It only goes but so far. But I have something that, that penetrates the soul, that penetrates the spirit. I have a covering that will cover you so much more down the line. So when God shows up on the scene and he sees that, you know, they're trying to cover their nakedness because everything is in the eyes of God. He's not a, 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 a shocked at this. He shows up on the scene and he says, Adam, where art thou? Adam, where are you? And for the first time, God shows up on the scene and they're not running to him excited to be in his presence, but they run from the presence of God. And God shows up and says, where are you? And he says, Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid myself. And God says, wait a minute, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit that I commanded you not to eat from? And then the blame game ensues. In Genesis chapter 3, we see Adam saying, oh, well, it's not my fault. The wife you gave me, God. And God, <laughs> he blames his wife. God goes down the line to Eve and says, Eve, what's going on? Eve says, oh, it's not my fault. It's the serpent. The serpent deceived me. He goes to the serpent. And God, being a just God, has to give curses to his creation, has to curse his creation. And so he curses the serpent. He curses the woman. He curses the man. When he says to the man is you will work until you die, you will return from the dust from whence you came. To the woman, he says, you will have desire to rule over your husband, but he will rule over you. There will be pain in childbirth. To the serpent, he says, you will crawl, over, you will crawl uh, uh, on your belly till the day that you die. But in his curse to the serpent, there is a ray of hope there is a ray of light. In this ray of, 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 of immense darkness, he brings hope when he speaks to the serpent, when he speaks to the enemy, when he speaks to the deceiver, when he speaks to the trickster, to the crafty one, to the liar, he gives a ray of hope. He says, I will put enmity and strife between you and between this woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This descendant that God is speaking about is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. He put strife in between Jesus and this enemy. Jesus was crushed. Jesus was bruised, but he was not destroyed. His heel was bruised, but in his death, he stepped and crushed the head of the enemy. We see in uh, the book of Colossians chapter 2, 15, the word says that by uh, the Lord canceled the record of debt that stood against us along with its legal demands because he set it aside. How did he do that? He nailed it to the cross. We were in debt. We were in God's pocket. It was a debt that we could not pay. The word says the, the wages of sin is death, is death. But here we see the gift of God coming into play because God sets that debt aside and nails it to the cross through Christ Jesus. He he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. As a result of this triumph, it allows us to say, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. He allows us to say, like Paul writes in Romans 8, in all these things, we can be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loves us. The same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is alive and at work in us. We have to know this. We have to live like this. And then God says something interesting. We see at the end of Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat it and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He says, they're separated from me. 
They're separated from me in their sin, in their nakedness, in their iniquity, in their shame. They are separated from me. Now, before they bite of this fruit and live forever separated from me, live forever in this fallen world separated from me, I have to intervene. I have to block it. I have to kick them out of the garden. There's another tree that they could eat from, this tree of life. They've eaten of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, and that separates them from me. But if they find this tree of life, and if they eat of this tree of life, then they can live forever separated from me. And I don't want to do that, so I have to push them out of this garden that I created for them. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that God blocked the things that I could have taken advantage of, that I could have walked in, closed the doors that I could have walked through. And in my sin and in my shame, I thought things were okay but God knew how much worse it could have gotten and God said let me stop him right here let me kick him out of there let me do these things so that it does not get any worse than it already is are you not so glad that the Lord saw fit to protect you saw fit to cover you saw fit to remove you from those situations saw fit to take you out and turn you around and make you new things were bad but they could have been so much worse But God in his wisdom said, let me kick them out of this garden. I give God praise for the ways that he blocked. I give God praise for the ways that he blocked, for the ways that he blocked that we had no knowledge of. Where he intervened, we were in danger, we wanted to do our own thing, but he blocked it. And I'm so glad that he did. Amen. 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 So he says in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, but believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare this place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself. And there where I am, you will be also, and you will know the way to where I'm going. Thomas says, Lord, we don't don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. From Genesis all the way till we read until John, humanity has been in utter darkness, waiting for this promise to be fulfilled, having a temporary covering, this sacrifice of lambs, this blood covering that would uh, cover the sins of the people, something temporary, but something permanent was coming. And Jesus, in essence, in John 14 is saying, the permanence is here. I am here. I am the way. He says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Newsflash, everyone. Jesus is not room service. Right? So he's not going to just go to heaven and say, I'm going to fluff your pillows for you. I'm going to have some mints on your, your little table here. I have your nice coffee waiting for you when you enter into the pearly gates. Come on in, guys. I've prepared the place for you. That's not what he's saying. This preparation is the exact opposite of that. This preparation is suffering. This preparation is death. This preparation is looks like defeat, but on the other side of that defeat is victory. This preparation is Calvary's cross. When Jesus says, I go to prepare a place, what he's saying is, I lay my life down and only I can pick it up again. And in me laying my life down, I now give you life and life eternal. I'm preparing a place. The place is prepared with every whip and every lash that went on his back. The place was prepared when the crown of thorns was placed upon his head. The place was prepared when the nails were driven in his hands and in his feet and his side was pierced. The place was prepared when Jesus Christ said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The place was prepared when Jesus Christ felt abandoned, felt alone, felt defeated, felt rejected, but knew he entrusted his life into the hands of his father. The place was prepared when he said, Lord, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. He breathed his last so that we could breathe our first, our new life in Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And you cannot get to this life. You cannot get to this father unless you come through me. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Where I'm going, you can't go, he said. He said, where I'm going, you can't go. When, when uh, 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 James and John were trying to see, say, Jesus, can we reign with you? Can we sit next to you? He says, you can't drink of the cup that I have to drink from. This is something that only I can do. This is a place that only I can prepare. So, so he says, he says that uh, I go to prepare a place for you. I go where you can't go to Calvary to take you someplace you can go, heaven, right? And the wonderful thing about it is it had to be Jesus. It had to be Jesus. Second Corinthians says, he, for our sake, he made him who knew no sin. Jesus Christ knew no sin, was sinless, was, was spotless. Him who knew no sin to be sin. To take sin on and be sin so that we could be made righteous. So that we could have a way out of our iniquity and into the kingdom of the true and living God. And Thomas says, uh, we don't know how to get there. Excuse me. I know you say you're going to prepare a way, but, you know, you're, it's like you're telling me a destination but not giving me the, the directions. How do, I, how do we get there? Where, what's the way? And Jesus says, you know the way. You're looking at the way. It is me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And there's so many that believe that all roads lead to the same God. All rivers lead to the same ocean. All religions are worshiping the same God the same way. But Jesus in this one statement says that is so false because there is one God, one true triune being. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And God the Son said, look, there's no way to this eternal life thing except through me. He saw the that separation that was taken when that fruit was bit. He saw that separation and said, I will be the way. I will make the way. I will be the road for them. I will do what it takes so that they can be brought into fellowship with the Father. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And the amazing thing about this is this was such a transformative, uh, strong, impactful statement and such a transformative idea that in the book of Acts, we see that Christianity was not first called Christianity, but it was actually called the way. So Jesus says this and the disciples take it and run with it. Did they become followers of the way when, when Saul, uh, before he gets uh, 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 his conversion experience and becomes Paul, when he's persecuting Christians, he gets documents that say if anyone belongs to this organization called the way, men or women, he can bind them, throw them in prison and drag them to Jerusalem. It says in the way, that's Acts chapter 9 verse 2. Uh, uh, in Acts chapter 19, it says, about that time, there was no little disturbance. Acts says this, this phrase a lot, no little disturbance, which means there's a great commotion about this, this organization called the way, right? So they're called the way, the way, the way, because the disciples took that and ran with it. In Acts 11, we see that in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. And so now we see that we are followers of the way. Yes, we are Christians, but we're also followers of this way, this truth, this life that's found in Jesus Christ. We are followers of the way. And if we walk in the ways of the one who said he is the way, then we are following Jesus the Christ. Then we should know as a result of that, as followers of the way, we are never without direction. We are never without direction. We are never walking aimless. We are never the walking dead. We are never without purpose. We are never without focus. We are never without a why. We are never without a reason for our walking. We are never without that reason. And even when our backs are up against the wall, there is a way, a way, a way out. Jesus is our way out of eternal separation from God which is death. The wages of sin is death, but Jesus is our way to life. And Paul writes in the book of Romans that just in Adam, all have been led to death and all have sinned in this new Adam. In Jesus Christ, we now find life. Third and finally, the third and final point is because Jesus is the way, he can make a way. Because Jesus is the way, he can make a way. 
If you want wisdom, the book of James says, ask and it shall be given. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. If you want direction in your darkness, my Bible tells me that the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119 and the word says in Job 23 that behold, I go forward, but he is not there and I go backwards, but I do not perceive him on the left at the left hand when he is working I do not behold him and he turns to the right hand but I do not see him God can be all around you but you don't feel him you don't see him near you you don't see him working you don't feel him closely but in verse 10 Job says he knows the way that I take and when he has tried me I shall come out gold He knows the way I take, and sometimes in the seasons of life that we don't feel God as near as we feel we should uh, feel him, we forsake him. We don't feel God here. We don't see God here. We don't see all these things happening that we feel should happen. But as long as you've been walking in the way, you know he knows your way. He knows the way you take. And if you're in a trying situation, if you stay the course, if you stay on the way, then you will come out gold. Psalms 37 says the steps of the righteous are established by the Lord. He delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong. For the Lord upholds his hand. I have been young and now I am old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God is with you to uphold you in the midst of your situation, in the midst of your storm, in the midst of what you go through. Your steps are ordered. This road that we're on, this way that we're traveling, it's not a wide road, it's a narrow road. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and easy that leads to destruction, and those that enter it are many. The gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. But the good thing is God wants you to find it and stay on it. It's a narrow road. It's a narrow way. It's a narrow gate, but it's worth it because it leads to life and life eternal. Jesus says, look, he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And we like to say, uh, 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 the truth shall set you free. That is true, but it's missing a key component. Before Jesus says the truth will set you free, what he says to his disciples is, if you hold fast to my teachings, if you hold fast to my words, then you shall know the truth. And then that truth will set you free. Many of us want truth to just come up to us, knock on our door and set us free without holding to the truth of the words of the true and living God that says, if you hold to my words, this truth shall set you free. So Stay walking on that narrow road. Stay walking on that narrow way. And the Lord will liberate you and free you from those chains. As I close, thank you, Lord. As I close and as the team comes up, there are many of us that are are, are dealing with so many different things. And we don't necessarily see a way out. We're dealing with so much and we don't necessarily see how things can shift. We have so much in front of us and so much behind us and so much on our shoulders. We don't see how we can uh, stay, stay uh, strong enough to, to under the weight of the pressure we're facing. But I need you to know today, I need you to believe today that Jesus is not just a way, he is the way. And he is strong enough and powerful enough to make a way for you in the midst of your situation. And he's strong enough and powerful enough to not leave you when it gets difficult. To not leave you when, it gets, when, it, when it's not easy anymore. If you want financial needs, if you have needs financially, he's your way maker. If you need physical healing, if you have uh, physical uh, ailments that need healing, he is your way maker. If you need peace in your mind, Jesus is your way maker. If you need peace in your home, Jesus is your way maker. No matter how bleak it seems, God is with you in the situation and in your weakness, he is strong to give you a way to get through it, to get through it one step at a time. And if he's done it before, he can do it again. 
again if he's done it before he can do it again he's not the God of a one-time miracle he's the God of a miracle after a miracle after a miracle he's a miracle working God he is sovereign he is awesome he is more powerful than we could ever imagine he is our way maker he has made a way out of our sin he has made a way out of our shame he has made a way for us to say death where is your sting the grave cannot hold us he has made a way for us to triumph with him in life eternal he has made a way he has made a way he has made a way I'm so thankful for the way he's made. Put your hands together and give God praise for the ways that he's made in our lives. Hallelujah, Jesus. You are a way maker. You are a miracle worker. You are a promise keeper. No matter what it seems like, no matter what it feels like, you're not going to leave me alone. You're not going to leave me abandoned. You're not going to reject me, God. You are a way maker. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For those of us here, if you can remain standing if this is you, but if there's others that may be sitting, if you find yourself up against a dead end right now and you don't see a way out, you don't see a way through it, you don't see a way around it, you don't see how you're going to get out of it, if you are up against a dead end and you need this way out, it could be healing, it could be uh, financial, whatever the situation may be, I need you to stand in faith if that is you and say, God, I'm holding on to you, my way maker. Let's pray right now in Jesus' name. Let's storm the gates of heaven in Jesus name dear God I thank you for each person here I thank you for each person that is saying Lord I need a way out of my situation and you are the way the truth and the life and so right now I hold to you God I trust in you God with arms open raised I say Lord you are worthy with arms open raised I say Lord you are sovereign with arms open raised I say God you are good and no weapon that is formed against me a child of God will prosper because I I am chosen because God has strengthened me because I am more than a conqueror and in the mighty name of Jesus Christ I can make it through we have to believe that saints of God we have to believe that saints of God and for some of us I said this at the 730 but I feel it again for the 11 for some of us we may be in situations like Abraham where God has called us to do something almost impossible and we're looking for that that way out and, and Abraham took the knife and he was ready to take his son out but at that moment God saw his level of obedience and stopped the situation and there was a ram in the catch this catch this there was a ram in the thicket where he least expected it there was a ram in the thicket with the horns caught in the thicket just as he was getting ready to slay his son God said I see your obedience I see your willingness to step forward as a result of your obedience the blessing will come as a result of your obedience the blessing will come so you can pray in faith but faith without works is dead and we don't want deadness in our lives so be obedient to the voice of the Lord be obedient to the voice of the Lord and that way will get made be obedient to the voice of the Lord and that way will get made. Let's give God praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. So, Lord, I thank you for your people. I thank you for those that need a way. I thank you that you are a provider and that you are stronger than anything, God. And I pray, Lord, that you would be the way for your people and make a way for your people because you are the way. I pray, God, that they would rest in your sovereignty, God, that whatever decision you make, you are still in control, whether it's the answer to their prayers or whether it's you, cha you choose to answer it another way, God, you are still in control. I pray that they would rest in your sovereignty, but I pray that they would also lean on your strength, that they would lean on your power, that they would lean on your authority, God. I I pray strength for each person in each situation that in their weakness you would be strong that they would feel you rising up and that they would feel that you are with them in the midst of their circumstance and we will not fail to give you the praise we will not fail to give you the honor or the glory for we ask these things in Jesus name amen and amen and amen God bless you all thank you Lord God bless you you may be seated you may be seated very quickly if you are here and you've heard this message and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't have a relationship with him. You're trying to do it your own way. Try and use fig leaves to cover up your mess. But Jesus says, I have something stronger. Jesus says, I have something better. 
If you raise your hand today and say, I'm in need of a savior, I'm in need of salvation, I want to get my life together, I want to come to Jesus Christ, if you would be honest enough to say, that's me, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand if you know you are in need of a savior, in need of Jesus Christ. You're not coming to me. You're not coming to the church. You're coming to a troop. God bless you. I see your hand. Thank you so much. I see your hand as well. Thank you so much. You're not coming to me. You're not coming to the church. I'll ask you both to, to just step forward, please. Just a step of faith. Just come forward. You're not coming to me. You're coming to the church. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Heaven rejoices when those come to Jesus. So let's give God a hand. Praise right now. Thanking the Lord for what he's doing. Right now, very quickly, I'll just ask everyone to stand as they come forward. Everyone standing, just very quickly as they come forward. Once again, if you are here and you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship with him, or maybe you, you once had a relationship with him and you're not sure, and you want prayer, you just want to be sure, you want that blessed assurance that Jesus is yours, and you want prayer, I'm going to ask you to remain standing while those that are sure take their seats. So anyone here? Okay. Thank you so much for your honesty. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please come forward. Thank you. This is just for you to just be sure. You want that blessed assurance. I thank you so much for coming forward. Okay. So I just thank you all for coming forward. I'm just going to pray with you very quickly and we'll have uh, the altar workers come to take you to the side and they're going to speak with you uh, concerning Jesus and the things of salvation. So I thank you all for your honesty. Um, you're not coming to me. You're not coming to the church. You're coming to Jesus. And so I thank you. Dear God, I just thank you so much, Lord, for your daughters, God. I thank you for your daughters. I thank you, God, because you love them, God. I thank you, Lord, for what you've saved them from, God. I thank you for what you're calling them to. And Jesus, I thank you, God, because you have protected them, God. I thank you, Lord. Uh, we protect them from the hand of the enemy that would try and come and sift them as wheat, that would try and come and snuff them out. And in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you, Father, because you have, uh, uh, at this moment, in this time, heaven is rejoicing because of their decision to come forward for you. I thank you that as they've made this declaration publicly, God, God that this would be a new chapter etched in stone that this would be a new season God that you're calling them to salvation with you that as they've made this decision publicly God that you would continue to strengthen them continue to keep them uh, aware and plugged in and in a community that can keep them uh, 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 just running this race well father so I thank you and praise you I pray for so that you would anoint the altar workers as they speak with them on the side and we won't fail to give you the praise for all that you're doing in Jesus name amen and amen God bless you thank you so much Bless you. Thank you. Very quickly, I'm just going to pray for everyone here because some, some of us that didn't stand, we all need prayer. Um, and then right after that, we're going to go into uh, communion and prepare ourselves to, to eat at the Lord's table. Um, so dear God, I just thank you so much for each person here, for each life represented, for each family represented, Father. I pray, God, that as these words have gone forth, that you would be glorified. That as, as these words have gone forth, that it would fall on good ground. That no matter what the situation uh, your people are going through, Lord, that you are more than enough that you are more than able and that you are able to continue to make a way for each of us, Father. I pray that our faith would be strengthened. I pray that our faith would be strengthened, that we would not waver and that we would trust in you, our way, our truth, our life. And we thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Let's prepare ourselves for communion at this time.